We've got about 10 minutes left, so I'd love to see a few more questions from the audience if we can get them. Yes, please. <coughs> well, <coughs> I just, did you say two years on that convergence? Do you think that's a, a reasonable? Yeah, I think so. Well, that's terrific. Uh, I, I do come down on, on the side of privacy of, of the genomic data, but it, in a sense, uh, you know, if, if the individual knows their odds of, of various diseases and the insurance company doesn't, uh, it weights the game, right? I mean, it's, I mean will the, I, it, it seems that uh, the insurance companies really wouldn't be able to survive if everyone who wasn't going to get sick knew that, and then they wouldn't buy insurance, they wouldn't pay into the pool, et cetera. <laughs> you know, I mean, I, I, so <coughs> for the individual to know their odds and nobody else to know it, uh, while for the individual, I kind of like that odds, but uh, it, it'll break the system. I, and so, I mean, I think it's, it's, it, there's really going to have to be, uh, you know, a way to, 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 for everyone to, to contribute to, to the health of the population and, and without being able to use their own, uh, their own odds to, to, for their own financial benefit. Now, I, have a, I have a quick answer to that, and then I'll let the rest of the panel feed in. But um, um, number one, I mean, if you're hedging your bets across the population by delivering this information to individuals, by and large, I think it's to keep them healthier. It's not to, um, you know, have people just drop out of the system and, and uh, you know what I mean. But so, I, I mean, that, 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 but well, is that how they are, they're going to use it? I mean, that's the I would be the goal. I would think, but yeah, I think the other aspect of it is that as you look across your portfolio of uh, pre-symptomatic risk, and we've looked across hundreds of people now um, for dozens of chronic conditions, an individual. Um, on average has one or two chronic conditions for which they're um, at increased risk significantly over the general population. And so you're sort of, you know, reshuffling everything, but I don't, I don't think you change well, the economics. Most of them have, have only one. It's rare to see a very significant mm -hmm. risk well, for two of them. But what is interesting here is that this, you know, ability to impute the sequence that we have you only need to genotype about 2% of the American nation, and you will be able to do the same kind of imputation as we can. So, so it's not only that there are going to be people who come and they want to have a genome sequence or want to be genotyped. We are also, whoever, be the big bad government or, or whoever, will be able to impute uh, the sequence and therefore get at least a lot of information about the population, although not the individual. I just want to... Dan, Dan, Jamie, quick. Really quickly, this, this, when we talk about genetic information in insurance, there's this tendency for this almost genetic determinism to creep into the, the conversation. People, you know, think that individuals or insurers are going to get this information and then be able to pinpoint who is going to be sick, who is going to be healthy, who needs insurance, who doesn't. Mm. Obviously, it doesn't work that way. We're still figuring out the extent and the accuracy of the predictions that we can make. But even if I had every single protective variant out there, doesn't mean that it wouldn't still be a good idea for me to have health insurance and for me to buy health insurance. I mean, yes, you've got an information asymmetry that's going to need to be addressed in some sort of way. I don't think Gene is a perfect answer to that, but it doesn't mean everybody's going to leave the insurance I mean, this, this, is, this is just the epidemiological data indicates that the contribution of genetics to risk or most of the common diseases is about 70, 75 percent. That is a pretty large percentage of the risk. So although, yes, they will not be able to say that you have it most definitely going to get a disease, these percentages, these probabilities become extraordinarily meaningful in the context of the insurance business. I mean, let me well, well I, no, there's something I want to hit on this because I think we're focusing too much in genomics. I mean, we're really talking about the transition to a society where we can compute probabilities for individuals on a much larger basis. And, you know, we, we can argue about the, the assumptions of the meaning of the whole genome sequence increasing our ability to predict more effectively and, and how much is in that. And quite frankly, it's going to wash up against the same thing that SNPs had, which is it just wasn't that predictive in the first place. And, you know, hype will reality and then it'll integrate through another curve and it'll get better. But the reality is we know right now enough if we impute the information we know about each other to make some very powerful predictions. And those tools are being used already by corporations, governments, infrastructure in the information war, the individual. I, again, I wholeheartedly agree to disagree <laughs> with the man on my right hand side. I can tell you recently, just as an example of the power of the genetics and how incredible impact it has, uh, we, have, we have a big process on the genetics of dyslexia. And just the other day, we pulled out a sequence variant that has enormous impact on whether or not you're a bad speller. And actually, if you are very bright, 
your I2 is very high, it, your, the, the impact of this variant is much greater. So if you take out those who, those who spell badly because they're stupid, there's a variant that counts for a, a very large percentage of it. I'm trying so, to decide whether you're imputing my genome at the no, moment. No, no, but, so, uh, <laughs> but the, uh, but, but the, <laughs> but the real, I, I, real I, I, question here is, I mean, I, Kari, I think we're both agreeing and disagreeing. I mean, we have to figure out, this, there, is, there is a, genome is a point part of this conversation, which is that how do we deal with a society that can use large-scale computing and information I mean, to predict it, it, the future? And, and it's not, I mean, you know, right now, you know, how, genome, how long did your parents live? The genome is the simplest form and therefore most easily to digitalize and analyze. Okay. That's the only thing you do. Well, let's hold it, hold it there, please, because we're in the rapid fire round uh, part of the discussion <laughs> now. So we've only got maybe five-ish minutes left. So let's try and get these uh, last few questions in. So uh, the lady here, please. Yes, I'm going to try to get you a little bit off topic there because you've already discussed um, individualized medicine. And my question is in terms of the other elephant in the room, which is education. And what is it going to take as societies across the world to educate both the Lame, layman people and, and, you know, typical people that go into the doctor's office as well as the doctors themselves because basically the probability is something to which all of us will have to address as this information becomes available. So right now people with breast cancer can decide to have mastectomies or not. What is the trigger when there's environmental factors that we don't understand or lifetime experiences and exposures? So where do you see this moving as we're propelling into $3,000 genomes, where do you see this going so that we can manage it as, as a medical community? We'll start with Dan. And then. Yeah, this is, um, this is a big elephant in the room, and particularly for uh, the PGP. I mean, Jamie mentioned that he uh, didn't pass the screening exam the first time, and you can retake it, you know, thankfully. But um, <laughs> there, there is uh, an, an incredible, you know, bias in the PGP's model as far as you know, who it is able to recruit because of this tremendously high bar that it sets, you know, and that starts with education, you know, the background information to make sense of this. And as this moves out into, you know, broader research um, studies, as it moves out into doctor's offices, not just in this country, but, uh, you know, around the world, uh, the education issue is a, is a huge one. And understanding, you know, you know, Carrie can sit here and, you know, exp you know, and understand, you know, what his relative risk is or what his lifetime risk is and, you know, and, fully comprehend that, but most people can't, even probably many people in this auditorium, let alone, you know, most people out there, you know, who, who just need to go see their doctors and learn about this. And so there, that is a, a huge problem and is going to be one of the, I think, limiting steps um, for really taking this out much more broadly into, you know, into individualized medicine and into people's lives is really being able to understand it. It's not just the patients themselves, it's the doctors as well and the people that, you know, we have a tremendous, you know, dearth of uh, genetic counselors, for instance. I mean, there are there are sort of problems across the board here as far as making sense of this information and helping people, you know, get access to it. 